Father, we thank you once more for your many wonderful mercies to us. We pray that we will take the time that you've given us to hear your voice, to study your word, to search, to know that we have a reason to believe that we, the things we do. Help us to get past the biases that hang on, the traces of Trinitarianism that we still have in us, and help us make the complete move away from the errors of Satan. Help us to see it's a curse to trust in men. Most of the men on this earth are still in a horrible deception. The church is destroying souls instead of saving them. Help us to make the contact of Jesus, to be connected, and then to listen to all his, his agencies, to listen to the heavenly intelligences. May we know the difference. Bless us now. Amen. Jesus has talked to Nicodemus, and after the initial amazement and astonishment of Nicodemus, Jesus told him, I say to you, we have noticed the comments of Ellen White, and now we're going to back up a little bit. We're going to look at what Jesus has done from the Bible. Actually, we're only going to look at one verse, 314, the brazen serpent, Moses. And then we're going to back up and focus on one word if we have the time. We want to really dig in to see what's going on here. Ellen White, of course, was not doing an exegesis on the verse or the, the chapter. She rarely does that. She just tells the narrative, what's going on, and then she gives the spiritual ideas. Well, there are some things that we can notice here. First of all, this is the second time in the Gospel so far where Jesus goes back to the Old Testament. So unless you understand the Old Testament, you're not going to understand the New Testament. That's just a given. So he goes back for the, the first time. He reminded us of the ladder that Jacob saw. Okay? And uh, when Jesus was talking and about that ladder, he was saying there were angels going up and down the ladder. Now, that ladder was let down from heaven. It did not originate on earth and go to heaven. It was let down from heaven. Jesus was in heaven, and he came to the earth. And so what Jesus was establishing by those angels going up and down the ladder, he was saying, I am the sole medium of communication between heaven and earth. So we need to remember that, that immediately he is saying things that no Trinitarian can believe because the Trinitarians say the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are dealing with us here on earth. Three gods. But Jesus, by that ladder, says he's the only one. All right, so that's very important, and that was not mentioned by Ellen White, but she does say it other places. All right, so then, in talking about this uh, brazen serpent, now he's taking another step. And he figured, no doubt, that he was speaking to Nicodemus as the teacher, and he would know what this was, and he was trying to stir his mind to see where he was taking him with his born-again experience. So, in, in looking at that uh, example of the serpent, he was getting Nicodemus to understand that Jesus was telling him that he is the medium of healing of a poisoned world. Now, Nicodemus got that one. Yes, yes, poison needs to be healed. And Jesus is saying, he's the healer. So he's beginning to understand some of that. Now, Nicodemus 
when he called Jesus a teacher, wasn't the only one that's ever done that. He thought when he was calling him a teacher that this, this young person who was gaining a reputation would feel, oh, this man is, <laughs> he recognizes me. This, he would think that's a pretty good thing. I can get, get him to understand that I'm appreciating him. But he, what he was actually doing was he was depreciating Jesus. I mean, that's an insult to call the Son of God who came here to save the planet a teacher. <laughs> and so Jesus didn't let him get away with it. He wouldn't accept that from him. He immediately said, you need to be part again. <laughs> he said, because you don't understand who I am. <laughs> what are you calling me a teacher for? <laughs> So, so we're immediately we're seeing some things here. Now, in Jesus doing that to this man, Jesus has told us something here that thousands in the Adventist church do not understand. And of course, when I say that, I really do believe the Adventist church had more information than any other church on the planet. But we're not using the information Jesus has given us. We have gone to the Sunday-keeping way of looking at things instead of teaching them the Seventh-day Adventist way. So what am I talking about here? When Jesus said, you do not have the capacity to see the kingdom of God, what was he saying? Was he saying Nicodemus was the only one in the world that doesn't have the capacity? I don't think so. <laughs> what was he saying? All human beings, unless they are born again, have no capacity to see the kingdom of God. <laughs> so do you, uh, do you catch what that means? If all human beings have the problem, how can it be that a single human being from Adam and Eve could be born without the need? To be born again. Impossible. There are no innocent babies. Jesus just said it. <laughs> now isn't that amazing that we have so-called teachers who call themselves pastors on the videos are teaching people against John the third chapter. And of course I could bring out several more chapters in the Bible. It's impossible for there ever to be a human who does not need to be born again. So that means every human on this earth, until that happens, is incapable of seeing what Jesus is saying or recognizing what the angels are saying to them. So this is very important. So now that, that he has put this in front, in front of Nicodemus, and we know that it, it uh, irritated him, that Jesus put him with the rest of humanity. <laughs> well, he was like the rest of humanity. Every human is a human. So, what he said was true, that Jesus is a teacher from God, but, but leaving it there, that's an insult. So now Jesus has to take him further into the incarnation that he is the son of God and he came down, he's the ladder and he's also the one on the pole. That's where he's taking him. It is very hard on Nicodemus because he's a Jew who believes he knows everything. He's a seminary teacher. He's, a <laughs> he's the teacher. So let us begin looking at this. We, we, we have just noticed a couple of things that are so clear if you understand the Bible that very few people on this earth have ever seen. You know, that's what we're looking at is why don't people see? Well, Jesus already told Nicodemus why. You need to be born again from above. Then, once you're part of the kingdom, then you will see. <laughs> and I think that's beautiful. It's so clear. So the first thing we want to notice here is Jesus said about lifting up that, that pole. And so Nicodemus, look, thinking about this, he would have to notice, why was it lifted up? Well, 
course, so everybody could see it. It had to be conspicuous. So if Jesus came here to heal, that would have to be noticed by everybody. He's here to heal. So he was beginning to put it together. So we, of course, looking back on it, we see these things. But Nicodemus was trying to catch what he was saying because he had, had never seen this kind of stuff before. So Jesus, of course, not didn't only say it to Nicodemus. He said this thing throughout his ministry. When he was in front of the multitudes, he said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know I am he. So this lifting up is something very important about him. It's just that little phrase he uses, lifted up. At the close of his ministry, we know that the Greeks came to him. And they came from the West, which signified to him, that's the rest of the world. He had a ministry to the Jews, but now he said, now outside of the Jews, they're recognizing who I am. Here they come. They said we would see Jesus. So he came out from the temple to be with them. And they want to know what is the plan. And he told them, I, if I am lifted up, will draw all men, the whole world, to me. <laughs> and he was telling them because they're coming with a pledge that the whole world is going to get this message now. Okay? And John, of course, added something that Jesus didn't say. And I'm not sure why he added it. Maybe he thought we wouldn't get it. <laughs> but he added this, he spake, signifying what death he should die. <laughs> He's going to be lifted up on the cross. And so John said, hey, folks, are you getting this? He's telling us he's going to go to the cross. <laughs> so John wrote it. Okay, it's in the Bible. So if we accept what we're learning in the book of John, of course, we're not going to the other books. We don't have time to do everything. If we accept what John is doing, we can see that Jesus knew he was going to the cross the whole time from age 12. He knew it. He didn't learn it as he went along. He didn't get it from the prophets only. There was something in him that was waking up. This is what we need to understand. This was not something coming to him externally. There's something going on here. So when he talked to people. Every time he talked to them, he wasn't talking about just today. He was talking about where this is going to end up. He knew it every step of the way. That's where this goes. This is where that goes. So forth. It all ends up at the cross. And we're going to look at that a little bit more, but first, we look at one of the things. He said he must be lifted up. You remember that? He said he must be lifted up. What does that word must mean? We're going to spend a little time with it if we have not enough time left here. What is the must? What does the word mean? Does that mean when he came to this earth, his father told him, you're going to have to die. That's not what the word must means. That's outside of him. The word must means an absolute necessity. There is no other thing to think about. This is the necessity in his own life. There's something inside of him that there is nothing to talk about. There is nothing to check as alternatives. There's 
There are no options. This is must. He must do this. That's what his heart told him. I must do this, no matter what. So let's, he, he must be lifted up. That, that's an absolute. We'll come back to it. So, mankind, we're seeing in Nicodemus, mankind, humanity, because of their incapacity, to see the kingdom until they're born again, Jesus must do what it takes to make it possible for them to be born again. <laughs> so there's the must. He says, I must be lifted up or nobody will be born again. So what put him on the cross? It wasn't the Romans. <laughs> it wasn't the nails. It wasn't even the Jews. We've all been told these stories backwards. It was the must. He came from heaven to this earth to be lifted up on the cross. He had to do it for himself <laughs> out of his own heart. And there's something more we need to see here. It is true he was obeying his father. It says that in Philippians. He learned obedience to the things he suffered. That, that he even went to the cross. Well, there was obedience involved as a human. But there's the God side, the Son of God side. You don't tell God what to do. He went to the cross in his God nature, in that human. They both agreed, that both natures agreed. He was only one person. It was the Son of God that said, I must be lifted up. Why the must? He must die. He must die. There's nothing else. He must die because he must save. Because he loved. See? So there's the must. Because he loved, he must save. Because he must save, he must die. So we must focus on that. And we'll try to do it as we go along here. He's not coming here just to get something done as a matter of, well, logically this has to happen. No, he must do this as the Son of God. And I'm going to try to open that up a little bit. Why it could only be the Son of God. There's no gospel without the Son of God. Okay, so when they said he came to save others, but he can't save himself. He can't come down from the cross. Well, it was true. He couldn't. He couldn't and be true to himself. He must die to make it possible for them to be born again because he loves them. <laughs> so when he went to the cross and he knew he was going there the whole time, that's what he came for. It was not a humiliation for him to go to the cross. That's the way everybody teaches it. It was no humiliation to him. That's what he came for. <laughs> now, they humiliated him in lots of different ways, but the cross was not a humiliation. He went there because he had to in himself. I must be lifted up. And so the cross to him was not a humiliation. So what was it? It was an exaltation. It was him being exalted before the universe. <laughs> and Paul says that Paul understood all of these things like nobody else on this earth probably ever understood them. But he knew when Jesus went to that cross, he was being exalted by his Father. Jesus said, glorify me, didn't he? And the Father said, yes, I will glorify you. I have been glorified, and I will glorify you again. 
we're going to the cross. <laughs> That's what he was saying. <laughs> so here we, we see when Jesus on that cross, not, not failure, not humiliation, not everything people think, but we see the highest exhibition of who he is. There is love on the cross. And Paul really moves on that. And John does in other places to see the love of God on that cross. That's why Paul said, I, I have decided no more philosophy, no more theology, no more arguing with people, no more, but only the cross. There they will see the highest exhibition of love and self-sacrifice. And so Jesus, when he was talking to Nick and he was, we don't get all these words. John didn't tell us everything Jesus told Nicodemus, but we're trying to pull out from the things he did tell, and John wrote them down, the things that are involved in those. Okay, so it's the highest exhibition. Now there's another thing here. If it's the highest exhibition, what about his powers? Ellen White tells us that the power of creation is why we worship Jesus. Now she didn't say we worship the Father for that or a Holy Spirit. She never says that because there was no Holy Spirit person involved. No God, third God. So she says Jesus is the one who made the Sabbath. She says that in Desire of Ages, the same book they used to say he, he is no longer the Son of God. That's ridiculous. She says he made the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. So we worship Jesus as the Creator. Now, He just didn't create the Earth. He created our solar system, and He created the galaxy. He created the stars, all the galaxies, all that power. But we need to understand something, and I don't think we hear enough about this, that all that power is secondary to the power it takes to take a ruined man and put him back together after what the devil has done to that man and put him back together into the image of God restored. <laughs> That's power. <laughs> Because when he did that, and when he does it, he does it without a flaw. There are no mistakes, no problems when he does it. He does it perfectly. And the devil does not want us to know that. He does not want us to know the power of Jesus. He does not want us to believe. He can restore us perfectly into the image of God again. Better than Adam was before he fell. <laughs> so we're not used to thinking those kinds of thoughts. The ministry of the church does not teach those kinds of things. I don't think you've ever heard a minister say those kinds of things. But that's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Don't call me a teacher and leave it there. <laughs> You need to be born from above. You need to know why I'm here. I'm here to make it possible for you to be born again. <laughs> and when you are born again, you will see what my power is. And when you believe my power, I will restore you into the image of God completely, fully. Do you remember Alan White said the third angel's message? 
is to believe that Jesus is able to restore us fully, amply, entirely. <laughs> she said it, what we're talking about right now. We must believe the third angel's message. We can't give the third angel's message if we don't know what it is. <laughs> That's one of the reasons we can't get stuck on the father-son thing. Yes, it's very important that we know there's a father and son, but that's not the gospel. John did not say to know about a father and son. He said to know the father and the son. And to know them is to make the connection. To know them is to have them inside. To know them is to be in the kingdom of grace. To know them is to be born again. It's impossible to go to heaven with just a few facts about the Father and Son. We are not doing people a favor by, by making them think they're saved now that they know there's a Father and Son. No, there's, Christianity is not about one doctrine, no matter how important it is. We, we need to see what Jesus told Nicodemus. Let's get a hold of this. There is, someone wrote this note. "'Twas great to speak a world." From not, tis greater to redeem. <laughs> oh, somebody understood. Yes, making worlds is one thing. Yeah, rocks and, <laughs> and water and all that. That's sure, that's beautiful. But to redeem a fallen person who had become a devil, now that takes power. So, Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus, you're a theologian, you're a rabbi, but you don't understand any of this. I'm trying to tell you things here that's beyond your human capacity to understand, but I'm telling you enough that you will see you really do need to move away from your education. You need to move away from all your values. You need to be born from above and enter a new life. And, and we better get there or we're not going to get there today. <laughs> what is this life? Okay, so those heavens, were, in Oregon you can't do it too often, but every now and then the clouds go away and you can look up and see those stars, those beautiful stars. And remember, the Bible says not one of them faileth because Jesus is the power that's maintaining everything, keeping everything just right. If he can keep all of that and not one of them fails, then what about me? Do I have to fail? Not if he is my savior. Not if he's the one that says, I make you whole. I put you in my kingdom. And there's nothing in my kingdom that's corrupt. Nothing. So we're beginning to see when he's talking to Nicodemus, he's really saying a whole lot of things to us that we don't know. We're in the same shape Nicodemus is in. We've been calling Jesus a teacher. We should have been calling him the Son of God. Oh, oh. <laughs> Do you know any people who don't believe he's the Son of God? Please don't answer that. So, not one faileth. There's a mightier revelation of divine power. When we begin to see from the ruin of humanity, he restores the divine image. And that's what Ellen White says over and over. That's what he came for. And he pieces it together. That torn up humanity, that, that ugly humanity that we even don't like. <laughs> Without a flaw, put together again. Fit to live with angels forever. So Jesus got on the pole to show the whole world why he came. That cross becomes his, his throne. Yes, 
It's not a punishment. It's his throne. He took our penalty. He was not being punished for anything. It was his crown. It was his throne. He was showing us what love is, his love, because that's all he can do. And when we begin to understand these things, we will know he died for me. Alan Hoy says, don't say he died for us. Don't say that. That's an abstraction. You can't get a hold of that. You say, he died for me. And when you begin to get that, you begin to see who died for me. The Son of God. And if you make him a metaphor, you don't have anybody that died for you. What good is one human dying for you, even if his name was Jesus Christ? No, it was the Son of God, the Creator, the Upholder of all those stars, and not one fails. He will not fail me. And because he will not fail me, I will not fail him. So he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all to me, to my throne. I'm the king of, of all humans who are born again. So now then, let's look a little bit further into this being lifted up. We don't need to go back to Moses and see all the people with their tongues hanging out dying. They were dying because they had poison in them. They were burning up. So those dying Israelites needed healing, but they needed also life because they were going to die right there on the spot. So they were supposed to look and live. But what does that mean? What does the word look mean? Well, Moses was instructed by Jesus to use that word, to look. Now, if anybody was there and they had been bitten by those serpents and they were burning up and they were dying and they saw that piece of brass hanging on a pole, what do you think they would think about? Would they think, well, there's magic in that brass. As soon as I look at it, it's, it's going to save me. No, they weren't stupid. They knew there was no magic in the brass. <laughs> Why should I look at that brass? There's nothing in that brass. <laughs> Now, the people who followed that through would say, I'm not going to look, and then they would die. That's it. They didn't do what they were told. But because it was Moses telling them, look, they knew, no, it's not just Moses. Somebody told him to tell us. Those people looked. Why did they look? Well, people teach, oh, because they had faith. That's the wrong word. That's, everybody has faith. When you get on that airplane and go up in the sky, that's faith that you got in in the first place. No, everybody has faith. Don't use the word faith. The real word is trust. When you trust somebody because they're trustworthy, you rely on them to do what they say. That's trust. And when we trust Jesus that way, you have freed him to do what he said he was going to do. You trust him, he does it. That's all there is to it. Ellen White said, it is so when you believe. Steps to Christ, she says that. It is so when you believe. And what is believe? It's trusting him to do what he said. So when they looked, they were saying, I trust you. Whatever that brass is, whatever that means, I trust you. You said, look, I'm looking. <laughs> you see, Jesus said it to us a different way. He said, come to me. He didn't say, get rid of the stuff in your refrigerator. He didn't say, stop smoking. He didn't say, say stop cursing. He didn't say anything. The only thing he ever told anybody was, come to me. Now who can't do that? <laughs> There's nobody
nobody on this planet who can't do that. If you're laying in the bed and your legs are broken, you can come to Jesus. Yes, your heart, your soul, your mind. You say, yes, Jesus, I want to come to you. Bang, you're there. And he takes it from there. We've got to come to Jesus. And he told them, look. So they looked. And immediately, the poison was gone from their blood. And I want everybody to think about that. How long did it take to be healed? <laughs> Do I have to work on it every day? I have to overcome this, I have to overcome this, I have to overcome that, I have to give up this, I have to... You're not going to find that in the Bible. He never said a thing like that to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, it was look and live. So, the essence of trust is the act of the will. To do something based on the reliability of the one you're trusting. Okay? So, they were told to look. And the ones that did were healed. The poison was taken away instantly. What is the poison? Where'd they get it? <laughs> yeah, that's, those snakes bit them. It was bad news. And that snake bite was healed by looking immediately. They had the gift because they had opened their heart. They didn't have to wait for it. They didn't have to do a whole bunch of things. They just needed to look. And someone has made the statement, you can't heal the poison in a man's veins by washing his hands, <laughs> by putting cosmetics on him, by putting ointment on him. No, it's going to take something more. And Jesus tells Nicodemus what the more is. You must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be a new person. And that new person will not have the poison in them anymore. So now, when a person looks and they're healed, what is the healing? That's what we want to know, because this is what trips everybody out. They start looking at themselves to see if they have been healed. No, he didn't tell Nicodemus to do that. Let's see what's going on here. There's a life that comes with the look. The life that comes from God is eternal life. It's not just life for today. It's eternal life. Now, here's where the hang-up comes because all the churches teach that eternal life means you will never die. That is not what eternal life is in the Bible. <laughs> so all the churches are teaching people the wrong reward. That is not the reward. That's not the gift. What is eternal life? Eternal life means the kind of life God gives. Not how long it lasts, but the kind of life that He gives. What kind of life does God give? It's called eternal life in the Bible because it's the kind of life He has. So what God gives the person who looks who comes to Jesus is a life that's in union with Him. It's a life that's joined to God life. And that is eternal. It's immortal life. It's pure life. It's holy life. It's real life. 
And so this is the frightening part. We've been told that we're supposed to be holy once we are born again, but we weren't told why it happens and how it happens. We thought we had to be holy because now that's all we ever do is holy things. No, we aren't holy because of what we do. We are holy of what we have become. We now are joined with Jesus. It says that in Sons and Daughters, page 291, fiber by fiber, vein by vein, we are joined to Jesus. Soul is joined to soul. That's what she says. That's been in the spirit of prophecy the whole time. How come we're missing all of this? So we have a life now that's in union with God. When Jesus said you must be born again, you're born again into that life with God. <laughs> you can't make it happen. People want to become Christians because they say, okay, I want to join your church. Well, that doesn't work. <laughs> no, we've got to join God, not the church. We join God, we join Jesus. We can't join the, his father directly. It's impossible. We must join Jesus. He's the only one the uplifted Son of God. This new life comes into us without poison. And that life without poison cannot die eternally. It's impossible. <laughs> and Ellen White says it that way. It's impossible for a born-again person to die eternally. I'm just quoting Spirit Prophecy quotes. We don't have time to go through all of those things. We're trying to understand what Jesus told Nicodemus, and he was getting it. He said, I've never heard stuff like that. He said, but I know what's in the Bible. I've seen it. <laughs> so here's the question for today. When do we get eternal life? When did the Israelites get it? The Jews uh, had been bitten and were dying. When did they get it? Now, here, today. And every Seventh-day Adventist said, but my whole life I've been thinking, when I get good enough, I'll get eternal life. It's not in the Bible. We've been trapped into a false gospel by the Trinitarians. And I'm saying this because we still have not left the Trinitarian thought modes. We need to get away from what the Trinitarians did to us and pay attention to Jesus now. He is the Son of God and the angels have been commissioned to guide us, to teach us. We must listen to them. They will show us and impress us what the scriptures are really saying. And right here, he's telling Nicodemus how to be part of the kingdom of heaven. He's got to see it first. And the only way he can see it is to be born again. And the only way he can be born again is to look and live to receive eternal life. The life that measures with God. So we are not going to get eternal life in the future. If we don't have it now, we're never going to get it. Now it's not too late to get it if we've been missing out. Yes, we're still breathing. We can still hear it. We can still understand. We can still get it. But when we look and live, we have eternal life at that moment. And that eternal life will then begin growing. <laughs> but it doesn't become new eternal life. It just becomes eternal life that's growing. We already have the life. The growing doesn't change that. So that means that when we become a Christian, a Bible Christian in the kingdom of Christ, we are 100% Christian. You don't 
become a 10% Christian and then start giving up things and learn doing better to become a 50% Christian. No, there's no such thing. We are a Christian or we're not a Christian. That's it. So when we look and we live, we have the life, eternal life now. Now, of course, in Steps to Christ, Ellen White tells us that there are conditions and there are steps. We must not trip over those. We do need our past forgiven, but it is forgiven the moment we're born again. Yes, it's gone. Now, here's the part we're, we were not told. When we're born again, the power of of sin in the present is canceled. <laughs> now, that statement does not say we will never sin again because yes, we can be trapped, we can get careless, we can turn away aside from our faith. There's lots of things we can do to ourselves. But that's not what God does. It's not part of his plan. The plan is to be born again, have eternal life, and move with him, abide in him. The reason people don't abide in him is they never got in. That's the real reason. A person who is in learns how to abide. And that's where our focus should be, is abiding in him. What does that mean? We can't get too far away from what we're doing here. Abiding means Jesus is always in your mind. He's always in your thoughts. That's abiding. And you abide in him in the same way. You are always in his mind. It doesn't mean his body is in you and your body is in him. Of course not. It's in the mind. It's in the heart. We can all do these things. So, whoever believeth in me shall have eternal life. Now we know what that means. Do you really believe in Jesus? Do you really trust him? If you do, you have surrendered to him. And he says, I accept you where you are. I give you the new birth. I give you the new life. Now let's walk together. <laughs> and the devil comes along and says, no, you better go back to being a Seventh-day Adventist. No, don't do that. You'll be a real Christian, and then you will be one of the few real Seventh-day Adventists on this planet. So let's look at this word, must. What do we have? We only have a few minutes here. Well, we'll get started. Jesus said he must. What is that word, must? We've already talked about it a little bit. It's a, a great necessity. It's a necessity. Now, let's just take a couple. We don't have time for more of times he said it. I want to start here. This is the one he said when he was age 12. When... Uh, Mary and Joseph found him, and they were a little bit concerned that he wasn't with them. They figured he should have stayed right with him. But he said, well, why are you thinking those thoughts? Wished you not, he said, I must, I must be about my father's business. I must. I know now who I am. I'm the Son of God. I see the sacrificial system. I know why I'm here. I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm here because my Father sent me. Of course, he volunteered and he had the idea first. <laughs> but he said, I must. There's nothing else on this earth that I really, really need to do. I must be about my father's business. Now, I would like to ask the Trinitarians, if Jesus was so enlightened that he now knew who he was, and he said, I must be about my father's business, did he know what he was talking about? He said, 
my father. Did he have a father? Well, in great in Desire of Ages, Mary knew he was not talking about Joseph. <laughs> well, that means he had another father, a real one. Who was the real father of Jesus? God the Father. Who else could it be? So if Jesus was a metaphor, how come he didn't know about it? This scripture out of his own mouth said, how come you don't know I'm the son of God and I must be about my father's business? I would like to ask the whole Seventh-day Adventist church, how come you don't know Jesus is the son of God and he must be about his father's business? I would like an answer to that. Well, there's more to be said about all that. But he said some other things. At age 12, he knew he was going to be the sacrifice. He knew he was going to be the savior of the world. A 12-year-old knew he was going to save the world. And he decided at that moment he was going to do it. A 12-year-old decided to be our Savior. And the reason he did it is he knew he was the Son of God. That's the only way he could make the decision. When he knew he was the Son of God and what he was in this world to do, obedience was never a question to him because that's what sons do. That was his heart, to obey his father. And if he didn't have a father, who was he obeying? <laughs> it was his own desire to save us. And he would do everything that was needed for man's salvation. It was all based on love. But the power behind all of that, he knew who he was. He knew the love in his heart for humankind, and he knew his love for his father. He had to live his sonship. And if he didn't have one, the whole Bible is a fake. All Christianity is fake. And this idea of a metaphor it's pure philosophy. We all ought to be philosophers instead of Christians. So right here in front of Nicodemus, he's telling us all the things the Adventist church is denying. The things that the, the people who say babies are innocent are denying that Jesus said. And I'm not going to give you the list of things he's denying because they're not true. We ought to study what he told Nicodemus more carefully. All right, I'm going to end with this. There was something inside of him because he was the Son of God in the form of humanity. Two natures in one person. He knew these things not because he was only learning them from the prophets, but those prophecies told him things that once he believed them, they, he recognized they were part of him. Now theologians get all upset about recognizing messiahship and all kinds of things theologians do. No, we don't need any of that. Jesus had a consciousness in him. We don't need to know how it works. But at age 12, we know he had a consciousness of his sonship. Jesus knew he was the son of God. And as the son of God, he knew he had a work to do. And in that work of going to the cross, that was his work. He didn't go there because he was punished. He went there because that's what he came for, was to go to the cross to make it possible for us to be born again. His obedience now should not be a mystery to us. 
His obedience was spontaneous. It was natural. He didn't have to struggle to obey. Why is that? What else could he do but obey? He said, I must be about my father's business. That means obedience, always. And if we are sons of God, it will become our second nature because we are born again to obey, not to get saved. We don't have to be thinking like heathen. Oh, I have to give up and I have to give up that and I have to give up that to be, a, to be saved. And I have to do this, and I don't want to, and I have to do this, it's not convenient. That's the way he didn't think. Do you know what that is when people think like that? Those people are slaves. They're forcing themselves to do things they don't want to do. That's slavery, that is not Christianity. When we receive the mind of Christ by being born again because we looked, we will obey the same way Jesus did. I must be about my father's business. So I think there's a lot more to Nicodemus than most people have recognized, and we haven't have just touched it. We don't have time to stay with Nicodemus, but we see there's a lot more there. We need to study. We need to ask the, the angels to guide our thinking. We can't think fast enough to get this. We have to ask the angels to help us, to guide us. And we have to keep studying the Bible because what we pulled out today was not in chapter 3. It was back in the time of Moses. It was at the cross. It was lots of places we pulled out from the spirit of prophecy. But all of it is right there. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he was telling him all these things. So that's the way we must study the Bible. We must always keep it connected. You don't study the Bible by studying one or two verses. That's not studying the Bible. When you study the Bible, the whole Bible is with you as you're looking at verses. You're tying them together. That way you're studying the whole Bible. It's the only way to study the Bible correctly. All right, we've, we've caught some clues here today. We need to keep following this up now. Father, we thank you for your patience with us. You know what we're made of. You never meant us to be this dull. But the devil's been at us for a long time. May we be guided now by heavenly intelligences. May your spirit constantly be striving with us. May we receive a Holy Spirit that's like your kingdom. Help us to understand that when we're born again, we receive a Holy Spirit for us to live a holy life, a pure life, because we're connected with your life. Help us to meditate upon these things. Help us to learn them. Help us to hold them, to live it every day, to know until it becomes second nature to us, and then we too will obey spontaneously, even as Jesus did. Help us to overcome what Satan has done to us. Help us to know it's true. It's all true. We can be like Jesus. Amen.